month on Extra Credit, we write a superhero story, make our own ancient cylinder seal, and so much more. Stay tuned. It's so good to see you again. Welcome to Extra Credit, where we meet interesting people, explore new ideas, and discover fun places together. Each episode will introduce you to people who use math, science, sports, and writing to make the world an interesting place. Let's say hi to our co-hosts. Hi friends, I'm Callie, and our theme today is Around the World. So we'll take a trip around the globe to discover some places and cultures that we may not be familiar with. Let's start by hearing a little from the Tan family. Lolo was my first roommate when I was a kid. <laughs> so we shared a room. She would keep the light on every night because she would be up praying and the light would still be on in the morning. And I just always remember her in the kitchen making hopia, smoothing out the mung bean, making little pockets with the dough and stuffing them in pink donut boxes. And she would let me eat the duds. How did I not have like childhood diabetes? <laughs> The kitchen was always greasy and the electric bill was going up, but that was Lola's business and she never stopped working. I was told that when she was little, she was the top student, but my mom did not finish high school because my grandfather passed away early. So she did all kinds of work to support her family. And when she had her children, she had to provide for us. There was nobody else. There was no, no such thing as vacation. And when Lola got older, she lived with us, bringing up her grandchildren. Yeah. It was, I think, 2014. And you called me. You were caring for Lola at the time. And, and so I wanted to come home to help care for Lola because... She'd always been the one who took care of all of us. Before she passed, she'd tell me stories about her life. And that's when Lola and I started painting them. You know, I think I learned from Lola that there's a difference between your job and your work. Your job is something you leave behind at the end of a day. But your work is everything you leave behind at the end of a lifetime. Lola, she didn't have the most glamorous jobs, but... I think her work was all of us. It's her love for us that I remember most. It was not so much of hugging or saying I love you, but it was all the things she did. You're right. We are. We are her work. Another member from the Dr. Blotch family empire demanding some brilliant writing from us. Let's hear about our new creative challenge, which involves writing a story about a superhero from your community. Hello, 86 Michigan families. Welcome back to our writing challenge. We're here bringing um, you- Excuse me, excuse me, Mer Morgan? Who's writing challenge? Oh, um, geez, Dr. Blotch, you're back. Um, and you're right, I guess it is your writing challenge. That's right, Morgan. Um, it's Megan, Dr. Blotch. I don't know why you can never get my name right. You do know which of the doctors Blotch you are speaking to this week, right? You know that there are dozens, even hundreds of us in the Blotch family, correct? All doctors, all Blotch, always right. And it would be silly to mix this up. And so rude not to know with whom you're speaking to not knowing someone's name, that's the absolute worst. Um, this is Dr. O. Blotch, right? Yes, of course, like Octavia or Olga or Olympia. I thought you would have known that. Why would you answer a stranger? You should be wary of strangers, Morgan. Anyway, anyway, 
Vegan, the previous Doctor's Blush have nominated me to call you this week, Vegan. And you know what? I almost cancelled this call because I'm feeling a bit under the weather. I'm just feeling a little bit sad because I can't visit my Uncle Dot or my niece, little Cece Blush. She's officially a child, yes, but a blotch child. So much different than a normal child. She already has a doctorate and she's only four years old. Um... Wow. Um, well, Dr. Blotch, it's completely normal to feel upset right now. A lot of us are. Right, right. Well, as I said, I'm not upset. No, I am cranky. I'm here in my tiny research cabin in Michigan's Upper Peninsula and humans in general are downright getting on my nerves. I came to the UK to get away from my family in Antarctica, and there are humans everywhere, and they're worse than my family. Um, well, feeling cranky is also valid right now, Dr. Blotch, um, but what about all the helpers that are out there right now, the people that are trying to make the world safer and brighter? I did appreciate going to my local fish-only grocery store for some white fish and thimbleberry jam pasties for my moon cat. I do feel very grateful for the fishers and other humans who are keeping our grocery stores running, and the healthcare workers taking care of patients at the hospital. You know? Actually, a very good point, Merg. That's that's quite rare from you. Um, okay. What are you talking about, Dr. Blotch? There are really are a lot of people helping out right now. And I'd like to read stories of the people who are being helping. Superhero stories. Oh, actually, you know, Dr. Blotch, that reminds me of our Young Authors Book Project from a couple of years ago. We wrote community superhero stories, and the book was set in Ypsilanti. So there were, like, lots of different... Um, community, fictional community superheroes and real life community superheroes that were featured in this book. Oh yes, yes, I remember telling you the idea for that last summer. I'm so glad you followed through. Anyway, anyway, enough distractions, Margin. I'd like to get to this week's writers to write stories about community superheroes. This can be a story of a real life hero in their community or a fictional superhero that they create. Whatever they choose, they should make sure to be very clear that their story takes place in their own city. I've read enough superhero stories that take place on top of the Empire State Building, or the Golden Gate Bridge, or the Eiffel Tower. But where are the magical and action-filled stories that take place in Ypsilanti, or Detroit, or Celine, or, well, anywhere in Michigan? Um, I can't believe that I'm saying this, Dr. Blotch, but I completely agree with you. Wow. Um, so this week, writers should focus on creating stories that, where the setting is where they live, in their community, in their city, right? Of course, Marjorie. Were you napping okay. while I was saying all of that? No. For example, if the story takes place in a restaurant, I want them to tell readers what restaurant it is and use details so I can picture it in my mind. If the story takes place in a park, I want to know which specific park and what it looks like and sounds like there. Okay, um, so for example, if my story took place at uh, 86 Michigan's Writing Lab, some specific details I could use would be like the beeping robot in the, in the robot store, um, the smell of coffee from next door, or um, like the fuzzy golden chair in the back of the lab. Exactly, Murgatroyd. And of course, don't forget the heroes. I want something new and flashy. Got it, Dr. Blotch, a brand new superhero. Yes, okay. perfect. Now get to it. I'll return on Wednesday to check in to see how your writing is going. Okay, bye.
Sikh Gurdwara of Rochester Hills. This community is one of Religious Diversity Journey's faith community partners. My name is Wendy Miller Gamer. I am the director of Religious Diversity Journeys. With over 20 million members throughout the world, Sikhism is actually the world's fifth largest religion. Here in Michigan, the Sikh community continues to grow and thrive. There's about a dozen Gurdwaras serving hundreds of families throughout the state. Today, Kennedy, a seventh grader at East Middle School, is going to get to explore the Sikh faith by asking questions of her peers, who she's going to meet soon, and some of the adults in the community. Hey Kennedy, how are you today? We're so excited to have you here at the Sikh Board Are you excited? Yeah. Before we start, um, we're going to just walk over, take our shoes off, and cover our heads. Sound good? All right, let's go over this way. For a Sikh, the key like goal of life is to make and understand this idea that the divine force is within everything and within ourselves and to reconnect with that divine force. And to do that, a Sikh uses the Guru. And the Guru for us is a sacred text. Guru actually literally means brings light to darkness. And the sacred text contains teachings that to describe how a Sikh should live their life and how one should make these connections to the divine. This idea of the divine force being within everything and there only being one, as well as using the Guru to help us connect with this one, these kind of make up the central tenets or beliefs of the Sikh way of life. Why do you think it's important for everyone, even non-Sikhs, to learn about these beliefs? So Sikhi is really based off of platform of um, good things like kind, being kind, being respectful, doing service, um, being compassionate. These are just things that basically anybody can learn, anybody can do, and we think that it would really help build a better society. The way we focus on things like love and compassion and respect and kindness and service it just makes our whole world better. There are many reasons that Sikhs wear their turban. The main reasons are, number one, it shows, it, it shows respect to Wai Guruji and it shows respect to other people. The second reason is that it shows a sense of royalty since we think the turban is a crown. And last but not least, the third reason is that our 10th Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, he didn't want the Sikhs to hide in the shadows. He wanted us to be unique and stand out. For me, it's something that's very personal. I remember my history. I remember like those giants, that shoulders that I stand on, those that came before me that stood for certain values. And those values I'm reminded of every time I tie every single layer of my turban. Do you always wear a turban or do you take it off at home? I wear it all the time, um, when I'm in the shower, when I'm sleeping, you know, everyone has their own style and flair. Thank you, those are all the questions I had. Awesome, thank you. So seva literally translates to selfless service. You do it because you genuinely believe in the importance of humanity and sharing with others. What are some seva activities you do with your family? So the awesome thing about seva is it can be done anywhere and anytime. So something that I do with my family and uh, with the Gurdwara as well is we do the seva food truck, which we make home cooked meals and we deliver them to the homeless. Seva truly is being selfless and realizing that we're all in, in this together. Can you tell me a little bit about this space? So this is called our Gurdwara, which literally means um, the door to our Guru. Our Guru, the Guru Granth Sahib, is a central um, focus of any Gurdwara. We have it a little bit higher as a form of respect. And then we have the congregation sitting on both sides. What does it look like to pray? 
Um, so basically when we're praying, we always have our heads covered and we're always sitting cross-legged like this. We're all sitting together on the ground as equals. We don't think that you can only pray being in one certain place. There's no restrictions really. How does worship make you feel? Um, for me personally, it makes me feel kind of centered and it keeps my mind calm and at peace. Whenever I'm going through um, like a challenging time in my life, when I'm worshiping, when I'm praying, I feel I do get a lot of guidance from the Guru Granth Sahib as well. Thank you guys so much for answering my questions. And I think this is a really special thing you do, so thank you. Thank you so much. I had so much fun and learned a lot of things. Are you ready to exercise your math minds? Let's go. Welcome everyone. I'm Mr. Leinberger and there's hardly anything that makes me happier than playing ukulele, especially if I get to make some music with my friends. satisfying, especially when it all comes together. Sometimes we start a new song and we're not sure whether we should strum fast or slow or finger pick it or shred some solo runs. And the first, two time, first few times through, the new song might sound pretty rough, but when it all comes together, it's the best feeling. And here's something that might sound crazy, but it's those songs that sound the roughest that feel the best when they come together. You might be surprised, but I was heavily into skateboarding when I was in my teens and 20s. Same situation. The tricks that were the hardest, the ones that I really had to work for, those felt the best when I finally landed them. When I'm working on a complicated math problem, I get some of that same satisfaction, especially if it has a lot of steps that take effort and persistence, but that finally come together. Solving a long math problem can be really satisfying in the same way as making music or skateboarding. Today, we're gonna to learn a method to solve division problems. We're going to learn to divide two and three digit numbers by a single digit number. And while it might look like there are a lot of steps, that just means it's gonna feel that much more satisfying when you get to the answer. And now, let's learn about the partial quotient strategy. Let's learn how this strategy works. You start by writing down your dividend and placing it under a table. No, not an actual table. That's what people usually call it. If our dividend is 150, then we start by writing down 150 and putting it under a table like so. For our sample problem here, let's do something easy and use a divisor of five. We write the divisor to the left of the table. The next step is to do a little mental math. What's a number that we could use to multiply by five that would give us an answer less than 150? This needs to be a number that we can multiply in our heads. Let's just use 10. Five times 10 is 50. So I'll write 50 below the dividend and draw a vertical line extending our table. Then I write 10 over here to the right side to help me remember the number I used. I've covered 50, so when I subtract, that leaves me with 100 to go. What can I multiply by five to get 100 or less? I'll just use 10 again. That's easy and a safe bet. Five times 10 is 50. I write 50 here, 10 here, subtract, and I have 50 left in my problem. Five times 10 is 50. So I write 10 to the right of the table and I'm done. 
Now to get my quotient, I just add up the numbers on the right side of the table. 10 plus 10 plus 10. That's 30. The answer to my problem, which I write on top of the table, is 30. Now, let's use some real examples to practice the partial quotient strategy. My band had 50 shirts printed, and three of us agreed to sell the shirts. I need to divide my pile of 50 shirts into three groups so it can be responsible for selling an equal number. In my equation, 50 divided by three, 50 is the dividend, and three is the divisor. I can also write it like this as a partial quotient problem. I put 50, the dividend, under the table, and the divisor, three, on the left side. Then I draw a line straight down. To help me visualize this particular problem, I'm going to add three stick figures representing three members of the band. The first question I ask myself is, how many times can three safely go into 50? Or, what do I know for certain I can multiply by my divisor? In this case, why not start with 10? That's an easy number to do in my head. 10 times three is 30. That's less than 50, so it's fine. I'll put 10 shirts, I'll add 10 shirts to each person. I'm distributing 30 shirts total. If I subtract 30 from 50, I get 20, which is the number of shirts left to give out. Seven would be too many to multiply by three, since that equals 21. So let's go with six. Six times three is 18. 18 subtracted from 20 is two. I've now given six shirts to each person, and there are two left over. How many total shirts will each person have to sell? 10 plus six. Each of the three band members will need to sell 16 shirts, and we've got two shirts left over. In math, we call that the remainder because it's what's still remaining, get it? The answer to this problem, the quotient, is 16. Let's look at another problem. We had 75 posters printed for an upcoming show. Again, three of us are planning to put up the posters. How many posters will each person get? This time, I'm not gonna draw my three people. Instead, I'm gonna write those numbers to the right side of my partial quotient diagram. My dividend is 75, and my divisor is three. Let's start with a safe guess. I know 10 times three is 30. That means 20 times three is 60. Let's start there. I'll write 20 on the side and 60 beneath 75. When I subtract 60 from 75, I have 15 left. How many times will three go into 15? That's one of my regular multiplication facts. Three times five is 15. I'll write five to the side. When I add 20 and five, I get 25. So each of us will need to put up 25 posters. Are you ready? Let's take this to the next level. Seven members of my band got together to play a show outside at an awesome outdoor market. As people walked around and shopped, they would drop tips in our tip jar. At the end of the market, we had $112 in our tip jar. So how much did each band member get to take home? We can figure that out. We'll use the partial quotient strategy to do it. I'm going to put 112 under my table and seven on the left side. I'm not sure how many times seven goes into 112, but I do know that seven times 10 is 70. I'll write 10 on the side, then subtract 70 from 112. Okay, I know it's 30 to get to 100 and then 12 more to get to 112. So 
30 plus 12, that's 42. I did that subtraction in my head. I'll write 42 down here. What can I multiply by seven to get to 42? That's another one of my multiplication facts. Seven times six is 42. So 10 plus six is 16, which is the answer. Each of us would get $16. Just to make sure you know this strategy, imagine if we had made, hmm, $543 in tips. Well, that would have been a sweet payday. But I could figure out how to split it using the partial quotient strategy. 543 goes under the table. It's my dividend. Seven is my divisor. I know that seven times 10 is 70, so seven times 20 would be 140, seven times 30 would be 210, seven times 40 is 280, seven times 50 would be 350, seven times 60 is 420, seven times 70 is 490, seven times eight would be 560, which is too much, but pretty close. So if I needed to make a quick guess, I'd guess that the answer is between 70 and 80, but closer to 80. Seven times 70 is 490. I'll write 490 here and 70 here. 490 plus 10 is 500, plus 43 is 543. So I'll write 53, that's 10 plus 43, down here. What do I need to multiply by seven to get 53? Seven times seven is 49. So seven goes on the right side, 49 goes here. And when I subtract, I have four left over. Looks like we'd each make $77 and there would be $4 left over. Today, we learned a useful strategy for division, the partial quotient strategy. We used it to divide a two-digit number by a single-digit number, and we also used it to tackle a three-digit dividend as well. Sometimes it will take extra steps, but extra steps are okay. That just makes the problem more satisfying when you've solved it. And as happy as I am talking about partial quotients, it's even more fun when you're rocking out on a ukulele. Today we'll be making a cylinder seal from materials you may have at home. You will need a thick crayon, a rolling pin, a toothpick, play-doh, a piece of paper, and a flat smooth surface. Instead of play-doh, you can use model magic, air dry clay, or homemade salt dough. Before we begin, let's put this art form in context. Cylinder seals are tiny stone artifacts that were first created in the 4th millennium BCE in tandem with the advent of writing. Traditionally the size of large beads, they were commonly made of stone along with faience, shell, or bone. Both cuneiform script and pictorial imagery were carved into the surface. These designs functioned as signatures of individuals or offices that owned them. When rolled on wet clay, the carved designs created a unique band of low relief impressions. They were used for administrative purposes and to seal boxes, jars, and even doors. Most had a hole running through the center, and they are thought to have been typically worn around the neck of the owner as functional jewelry. To begin, think about lines, shapes, and symbols that are meaningful to you. Using a crayon, make a simple sketch of the design you would like to carve into your cylinder seal. Whatever you carve will be printed backwards, so if you want to make letters or numbers, draw them backwards. Next, remove the wrapper from the crayon. The crayon will be your cylinder seal. If you like, break your crayon in half so you can practice carving on one half before working on the other. Using a toothpick, 
Carefully carve your design into the crayon. A toothpick is pointy, so be careful that you don't poke yourself. The deeper you carve, the higher the impressions will be. Carving above the sketch paper will make cleanup easier. Once your design is finished, flatten the Play-Doh on a smooth, hard surface. Start on one side and slowly roll your seal sideways across the surface, leaving an impression. Congratulations, you have your very own cylinder seal. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. My name is Dima Al Gamal. I am a member of the Muslim Unity Center Interfaith Committee and a formal board member. The Muslim Unity Center was founded in the early 90s, and uh, there's about 300 families uh, who are members of the Muslim Unity Center. Muslim Unity Center is home away from home to a lot of community members. Maria is going to be our guest today. We invite her through multiple sessions to uh, explore our values and our tradition, the Muslim uh, faith traditions. She will learn about the fundamentals and origin of Islam. She will also learn about the contributions of Islam to civilization, as well as the role of women in Islam and much more. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Welcome to the Unity Center. My name is Dima Al Gamal. I'm an Interfaith Committee member. Welcome to the journey. Let's start. This is Patrick and Arib. Hi. Hi, Assalamu alaikum, Maria. Nice to meet you. What are the fundamentals of Islam? Uh, the fundamentals of Islam. Well, you know, Islam is built upon five pillars, the first of which is called the testification of faith, the Shahada. And it basically it states that you believe that there is no God worthy of worship except God, one God, and that the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Is Islam a new religion? Muslims believe that from the time of Adam and Eve all the way up to the present and cont uh, continuing through a line of prophets and revealed scriptures that Islam came as a completion of that chain of revelation. Who are Muslims? Muslims represent every race and nationality across the world. Did you know that not all Muslims are Arabs? Only 15% of the world's Muslims are Arabs. Here at the Unity Center, you'll find people with origins in the Arab world, from East Asia, from Africa, um, all over the world. Pam, what are you doing? Uh, we're just uh, setting up decorations for Eid. What's Eid? Eid is the Arabic translation for a holiday, and Muslims celebrate two holidays, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. How do Muslims celebrate Eid? They celebrate Eid by gathering at the local mosque for special congregational prayers and services. They give charity to those that are in need, and they also gather with family and friends and celebrate with good food, fun, new clothes, and plenty of gifts. What do you say to a Muslim during Eid? We say Eid Mubarak, which means a blessed holiday during both Eids. How many times do Muslims pray each day? Muslims pray five times each day. When you see a Muslim pray, you will most likely see them going through different motions. You'll see them standing up. You'll see them bowing down. You'll see them then prostrating. This is the greatest way of showing one's submission to God. Do Muslims only pray, pray in the mosque? So for a Muslim, he or she are able to pray anywhere, any place. The moment the time comes in for prayer, they are asked to pray. This is why some students prefer to uh, pray in a quiet place in school. Do men and women pray in the same place in the mosque? The answer is that women are given the option. In the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, 
women and men prayed in the same prayer hall. So it is permissible Islamically for men and women to pray in the same prayer hall. Can you tell me about what Islam has contributed to civilization? That's a brilliant question. As you can see from these 1001 invention posters, that the Muslims contributed to schools, hospitals, the universe, and the Muslim civilization. And this ran from the 8th century all the way to the 16th century. And this was uh, titled the Golden Age for the Muslims. Can you explain to me why you're covering your head? Sure, that's a question I get asked often. Islam teaches modesty for both men and women. The Islamic dress code for women is referred to as hijab. So once a Muslim girl reaches the age of puberty, she will cover her body with loose clothing, um, only showing her hands and her face. And hijab looks different in different parts of the world because it's influenced by culture. And you'll see some of the moms and the daughters outside. Um, some of them are wearing hijab, some of them aren't. And there might be a little, some subtle differences in the way that they choose to wear hijab. What is a woman's role in Islam? So Islam teaches respect for women regardless of what their role is as mothers, daughters, wives. The Quran has many verses and through the prophetic teachings that emphasize respect for women and teaches equality of men and women in their deeds and their spirituality. Does Islam support arranged marriage? No, not at all. In Islam, for a marriage to be valid, both the bride and the groom have to give their consent to the marriage, otherwise it's not valid. Thanks for a answering my questions about women in Islam. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for asking. Thank you for coming today, Maria, and for visiting the Muslim Unity Center and learning about your Muslim friends and, uh, and neighbors. And hopefully you can come again and bring your friends and your family. Thank you for showing me around. My pleasure. Come again. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Welcome fitness friends to Impact at Home, where we practice interrupting prolonged sitting with activity. I'm Samantha Weinsweiss and I'm here to help you get moving for the next eight minutes. You'll be surprised at what these moments of movement can do for you and the rest of your family so you can stay active and healthy at home. So go ahead, get up and let's start moving. For this movement activity, we're going to be riding the wave of fitness fun. So we're going to do two movements. First one is going to be jumping jacks. So remember, we want a big star out, nice and tall and straight when we come back. And our second movement that we're going to do are air squats. So let's talk about our air squat form real quick. We want to stand nice and tall with our shoulders back, our hands to our sides. Take your hands, move them just slightly forward, take a look down, and get the laces part of your shoes or where they would be on your feet underneath your fingertips. That'll be shoulders hip width and shoulder width apart. We want to look forward with a nice straight back and shoulders. Keep your head up. We want to keep our heels down. We want to get our bum to the level of our knees. Our knees should always either follow our toes forward or we can turn our feet out and our knees can go slightly out. We never, ever, ever want our knees to collapse in. So let's go ahead and try a couple air squats. And go, folks, down and up. Try another one. Good. If you can't make it down that low, it's okay. Just do the best that you can do. I think we're ready, though. So we're going to start our wave with five. Five of each, then we're gonna do four of each. Three, two, one, and then we're gonna make our way back up to five of each. I believe in you. Let's go ahead and do it. So first one, five jumping jacks. Ready, three, two, one, go. One, two, three, four, five. Now we go to our five air squats. One, two, three, four, and five. Excellent, four of each. One, two, three, four. Four air squats. One, two, three, four. Three jumping jacks. One, two, three. Three air squats. One, two, three. Nice job. Now we're gonna do two jumping jacks. One, two, two air squats. One, Two, one jumping jack, 
one air squat. All right, now we're working our way back up the wave. So now we're gonna go two jumping jacks. Two air squats. Okay, three jumping jacks. Three air squats. Nice job, friends. Keep going. We're going to move to four jumping jacks. Three and four. And now we're going to move to four air squats. Two, three, four. All right, our last round. Five jumping jacks. Ready? And go. And five air squats. You did a great job riding our fitness wave. Let's go ahead and do a little bit more to get out some bonus wiggles. So hop on down and have a seat. We're gonna do another little version and we're just gonna do a three to one wave, a little mini one, and we're gonna do them with planks, or sorry, uh, we're gonna do them with flutters and sit ups. Ready, three flutters each leg, so six all together and go. One, two, three, four, five, six, three sit ups. Now two flutters on each leg. One, two, one, two, two sit ups. One flutter on each leg, one, one, and then one sit up. Good, now we're gonna build our way back up. Two flutters on each leg, one, two, one, two, two sit ups. And now three of each. We're gonna go ahead and do six flutters all together. One, two, three, four, five, six. Excellent job. Now three sit-ups, friends. One, two, and three. So those are fun little ways that we have a fitness wave. If you want a little bit more, let's go ahead and do some plank and push-ups. So let's do a three, uh, ride the three again. Ready, here we go with push-ups. One, two, three. Hold it right here for planks. One, two, three. Nice job. Two push ups. One, two. Hold it for planks. One, and two. If you need to do these on your knees, that's fine. You can do them on your knees. Let's go ahead and do our one push up and hold it for one plank and down. Next, we're going to go into two push ups. One, Two, hold it up here for a two second plank. One, two, and down. And now we're gonna finish that mini wave of three push ups. One, two, and three. Hold it nice and tight for a three second plank. One, two, three. All right, fitness friends. We had some fun fitness there. Let's see if we can do a plank challenge. Ready? See how long you can hold that plank. You can do it on your elbows or all the way up. Ready, and go. If planks are a little boring for you, do plank jacks. Or you can alternate and do some plank shoulder taps. Keep holding it there. How long can you go without coming down? If you need to do planks on your knees, go ahead and you could do them on your knees. Can you keep holding them? Go, fitness friends, go. How long can you make it? Whew, I can feel the burn, can you? Can you do it with one leg up? How about with the other leg? Keep going, nice job, fitness friends. I like those plank jacks. That may be my favorite. All right, we are almost there. Keep going. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, our fitness time together today is done. Nice job. 
I hope you enjoyed today's movement break. Impact at Home is a chance to apply the skills you may have learned in your PE class to improve your health. To learn more about the health benefits associated with daily movement, visit impactathome.umich.edu. Now don't forget to fill out your daily log. We will see you again during our next workout. Bye, fitness friends. I'm a freelance announcer in Tokyo, Japan. I do MCs for events such as doing the stating announcements to formal MCs such as gala dinner MCs or government organized events. And I do radio personality. I also do voiceovers. If you like being up on stage or if you like presenting, if you like helping people, I think you're perfect for the communication field. Make sure that you use your voice for the positive results. For example, change the world or you know, make people happy, make a difference. And I think if you have that talent, then use your voice. I believe that um, even the bad things are meant to be, but um, it's very difficult to overcome that and develop resiliency unless you believe in yourself. You just have to always believe in what you do. Hi, my name is Reverend Bethany Pierbold. I am the Associate Pastor for Youth and Mission here at First Presbyterian Church in Birmingham. We call ourselves Everybody's Church. Our mission is to cultivate Christ's love through mission, inclusion, and community. So Christianity is really diverse. It's got 33,000 denominations worldwide. Uh, there's 2.5 billion Christians in the world. At our core, we all follow Jesus and the teachings that we find in the Bible. So today we've invited Mariah and Lucia to join us uh, on this religious diversity journey through Christianity to learn a little bit more about Christianity and how we practice and what this is. So I hope that they just learn that, uh, something new, something they didn't think was in Christianity before. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Sure. I'm Mariah. I'm Lucia. And I'm John. I'm Bethany. I'm Lily. Welcome. Come on in. Yeah, we're glad you're here. First question is, what is the Bible? Christians have lots of ways of talking about the Bible. Many of us refer to it as the Word of God because we believe it was inspired, literally, by the Spirit of God. Uh, we as Presbyterians talk about it as the rule of faith and life, meaning it teaches us everything we need to know about faith in Jesus Christ and about how to live our lives. Yeah, I love to uh, look at the Bible and see all the ways that God has taught us and shown his love towards us in so many different ways. How do you use the Bible? Uh, personally, as a pastor, I, I use it as the basis for my preaching and my teaching. But the other way that I use it is devotionally, meaning we, we, I read it and then allow the Spirit to speak to me through what's on the pages. Are there beliefs most or all Christians have? Yes, there are two beliefs that most Christians have. The first is what we call the divinity of Christ, meaning we believe Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And the other is this thing called the Trinity, which is probably one of the most confusing of all Christian beliefs. But I think uh, Bethany is going to talk a bit more about that inside in a few minutes. Trinity is a very complicated uh, idea and some adults don't even understand it. I've heard it explained a lot of different ways, but this is my favorite way. So, Lily, what is this? It's an egg. Good. What is this? The yolk. And that is? The whites. Good, so we have three parts that make up an egg, just like we have the Creator God, Jesus God and Holy Spirit God, these three parts that make up what we think about as God. What do you think are some um, misunderstandings that people have of Christianity? A common misunderstanding is that Christianity is only one way 
and there are so many different kinds of Christians. Um, like I said, we're reforming and we're always moving forward in the Presbyterian Church. Um, so we have accepted LGBT people into full inclusion. They can be ordained, they can be elders here, um, but some other churches still consider that a sin. Um, women in leadership is something that a church might differ on. So there's lots of different belief systems within Christianity, so we're not all the same. So Reverend Bethany, why is Jesus so important? So Christians believe that there's a problem in the world called sin, and sin is anything that's not loving, and God and humanity have tried to fix this problem in lots of different ways, but God's final way of fixing this problem was to send Jesus. And Jesus lived a perfectly loving life and taught us how to do that, and then died on the cross so that we could be saved from our sins as well. So Jesus is really important to us. Gustavo, why is Jesus important to you? Well, Jesus was um, the messenger of God and the son of God. He showed us how to live a good Christian life by example, showing love and treating the others treating others the way you want to be treated. Um, he died on the cross for us, and I respect him a lot for that. That makes sense. What is the white thing that you wear on your neck? Yeah, so this is a clerical collar or a tab collar. Um, it started, you know, way back in the Victorian era where they'd have those big frilly collars and pastors wanted to be more simple and so they made this more official. It was actually a Presbyterian pastor who created this as the sort of clerical collar and when I go out shopping I can take it out so I don't have to be a pastor anymore and then I can put it back in when it's time for me to visit someone uh, and be a pastor again. Pastors also will wear um, a special robe during worship or stoles and the stoles are different colors. They usually go along with whatever the color of the season is. So right now we're in ordinary time, so it's green. Uh, we have Advent is purple. We have Pentecost, which is red. Um, weddings, I might wear one that's a little bit more frilly and white. So there's lots of different reasons. Um, and they convey different things. I have one that's a rainbow stole, and that's to show that this church is open and affirming of LGBT people. Thank you so much for being here. You and Mariah had such good questions. We're so thankful that you came. Thank you for having me. I learned a lot. Well, we're glad you guys were here. It was a great time. Yeah. Okay. Bye. My name is Elizabeth Remy Johnson, and I'm a musician with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. If you wanted to make a concert grand harp, it might take you a year, but we can do a pretty good job with a box and some rubber bands. This is one that's already completed, and I have a regular box here and another file folder box here. You can use either one. If you find a shoe box, the smaller the better. You can decorate it any way you want and then get a bunch of rubber bands. If you can find ones of different sizes, that'll be the most fun to make different sounds. So you do want to make sure you have a grown up helping you. You don't want to get your face too close just in case these do break. And you just stretch it over the box. Make sure you like the way it sounds. That's pretty good. I'm going to use a blue one next. That's pretty similar. So I'm going to try to find a smaller one that'll stretch even more and maybe make a higher sound. That's pretty good. So this is pretty done. That's a good harp right there. And now, if you have a file folder at home, you can make a different kind of harp. Maybe you might need bigger rubber bands for this one. The more you stretch them, as long as they don't break, the more tension there will be. And the 
the pitch of the rubber band will change. Good, that's two different sounds. Let's see what this thick one sounds like. Pretty good. Here's another big one. Sometimes you need to adjust a little bit. That's pretty nice. Da 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 da. And I think we need one more. That one's going to be too small. So use another blue one. You can either pluck it or do your glissando. It's time to go, friends. I had so much fun learning about different cultures around the world. If you could visit one place from the show, where would you go? See you next time. On the next episode of Extra Credit, you visit Australia and learn how to draw a koala. Plus, our friend Kennedy takes us on a field trip to the Hindu temple of Canton to learn about Hinduism. Get your extra credit on the Michigan Learning Channel. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the state of Michigan, and by viewers like you.